Hello and good morning to all of you, or, or good day. I actually don't know which time of day it will be for you when you see this talk. However, I'm going to say already that this talk is not turning out the way I intended it to be. And that is mostly because I have been working on the thing that I'm going to present. So that meant I had less time to actually prepare the talk. And well, let me just give you a demonstration of it here online on uh, callreflect.org slash run. And I'm uh, going to talk later about what it is that you are actually seeing. So we click on run. We, with some luck, we get uh, some output, but not if we run it with dash C, because it's going to run at runtime. So we click on run now, and it says let's iterate over all fields, and it shows a few strings here. And what it iterates over is the fields in reflect me. And you might say D already has uh, traits all members or traits derived members and I can already reflect over fields that is true but it requires you to use what is known as a compiler tuple and compiler tuples are essentially the same things as anonymous types in the C++ reflection proposal and they have the issue that they create new unique entities within the type system. And the type system is something that's all about finding out common properties of these entities, of these types. So the more unique types you introduce, the harder it gets for the system to find out all these common properties because it has to look at all of them or at a significant subset of them to see which one of them match to each other, which is why it is not very wise to build something on top of types if you are going to introduce uh, many unique types. That's why Core Reflect chooses a different route to expose meta information that does not rely on creating unique types. Rather than creating unique types, what it does, it creates class instances. If we follow this link, then we will see then we will see that there is a a visitor defined here that visits classes and these classes can be seen here. For example, you have a, a, a module called Tackle in which you have all the different declarations that you may encounter. You can see that a declaration has a name, it has attached UDAs, it has a linkage, a comment which may not be there, a mangled name, which is the mangled name, a location in, in the source code, and uh, a lexical parent in, in, in some cases. And we can, we can see how uh, those may be explored soon. So you can see there are function declarations, enum declarations, there are enum members for enum declarations because although an enum member is almost like a variable declaration it is not quite so it it makes sense to have their own classes here and also core reflect tries to follow the um the dmd data structures relatively closely such that people already familiar with how to work with DMT can trivially work with Core Reflect and the other way around. 
people who are getting familiar of how to work with Core Reflect, they will be able to more efficiently work on the DMD front end. And I think that we do need more people who are not scared of that. There are plenty of reasons to be scared of the DMD front end, but not knowing the structure of things shouldn't be one of them. You should be scared by the underlying problems in the architecture of the front end and not by these service level things. So let's quickly go over this. So here we have a program that reflects over the structure. It gets at the field and it can filter these fields. Right? For example, whether there are very important or whether they are labeled as unimportant, you will see them here in the output. One thing I'd like to show you is um, the the um, the structure of these things. For example, what I can do here is I can put a pragma message in here and say pragma message note from name. main just like that and that should give me information about this main function here so when I run that I do get a whole lot of output this is all the information that we have about the main function so we know it's a function declaration we know it's declared in line 35 it's inside a module and then which is the interesting thing we get all the information about that module like we can see that uh, for the members of that module there is the, the struct declaration reflect me which is of a type struct it has variable declarations in it, blah, 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 blah. We see, we see all the information about this. Uh, we see the, where these things that we are using here come from. This uh, reflection node, the node template that it uses, we can see that in here. So you get a whole info dump of the compiler internals, basically and you can use them in your program. That is how, how call reflect works. It works by you requesting to get information about your program and you get all of that information bundled up in a class structure, which you can then use as you wish. For example, one of the things you could do is you can detect if there was padding in the structure. So you, you could write some code, some relatively regular code, but that's the thing. You can take this, write some code. This is like yeah, it's in the visitor, but apart from that, it's like fairly regular code that you would write, like you scan through all the fields and if there are wasted bytes, you just write like very regular code. You see there's, there are almost no templates in here. I think in this case there are no templates in here and you can run it. And when it's run, it can tell you that the check exception has four bytes of wasted space between the ref count and error. And there is wasted space between the type and the name field in like line 1003. And this, and to take something that's maybe a bit better than scanning std XML 
what I could do is, is, is common that out and use this struct as for example where I have manually introduced three bytes of uh, space between B and D and we could run that and if we did that we would see that in the struct S which is defined in, in uh, line 14 in this online app oh that there are just two bytes of waste between between B and D because I have two U bytes. If I had just one U byte there would be three uh, bytes of waste. And uh, yes, this this static search of course won't work when we when we comment out that thing. So now we can see yeah there's three bytes of waste and you can write regular code that runs either at compile time or at runtime to work on the uh, the information that you extract from your source program and what that allows you to do is something fairly nice being able to run your code that works on the reflection data that you extracted from your program or potentially somebody else's program at runtime or at compile time allows you to circumvent the limitations that CTFE and the template meta programming techniques currently have, which is that they use lots of memory and take lots of time to be executed, whereas the same operations done in regular runtime code are blazingly fast. So what Core Reflect does is it does nothing but essentially serializing information that the compiler has about your program and putting it into like I already said in this class hierarchy in this data structure that you can look at and from then on you can basically do whatever you want you can like report where there is padding nicely you can scan for violations of naming conventions, you can write your own linters, you can do a lot of things. Uh, right now, however, Core Reflect is not particularly ergonomic. It's very low level, it, it gives you something that looks like the AST of DMD, which is not uh, maybe the most well pruned thing in the world. Uh, although I'm trying the best I can to canonicalize this AST form and to protect you from some of the weirder edges that IDMD can produce. I'm still fundamentally shackled by how DMD works, which is partially why I didn't have time to prepare this talk very well, and which is why uh, Core Reflect is not going to be released anytime soon. And that is Basically, although these simple examples here work, and they work quite well, um, more complex usage scenarios do not. And that's, that's a serious issue, actually. Since I'm running up against limitations inside DMD in the way that it process source code in the way that it relies on certain parts of the compilation process to work in certain ways and the requirements are not documented and they're hard to understand and right now in order to make core reflect into the thing that I want it to be where you can freely browse your code and make decisions based on that either at runtime or at compile time that vision right now cannot be realized and that is that is quite disappointing 
I was going to show you performance metrics where you could see that a fully qualified name, for example, implemented with Core Reflect is much, much faster than the one that you get when you import from Phobos. And maybe I still do that, but right now I do not want to advertise it too loudly because it's not done yet. And rather than putting half finished things into the compiler, I would like to have them at a place where I'm happy with them, except if somebody is really, really eager to have them, then I would maybe change my mind and give you the half finished version of Core Reflect, but right now I cannot do so, since it really when you have to be careful to pick your examples such that you pick some that'll work that is not a good way to build a feature for the compiler which is a foundational piece in every software project uh, where you do not want to run against any very gnarly and weird corner cases in which the feature you were promised doesn't work properly. And for the remainder of this monologue, I would like to talk a little bit about that, which is basically just that right now I'm working on a system that will allow me to reconstruct how DMD is actually working internally. And it is quite, uh, quite remarkable that you have to build an external tracking system to understand the dependency and the code flow inside the compiler. But since it grew into what it is right now, uh, that's really the only way. I could also show a few of the more gnarly examples where you can maybe see more easily what I'm talking about. But I would also like to refrain from that. The only thing I really want to give you is an appreciation for how much incredible work there is in DMD and something that allows you to relatively easily extract parts of the AST at compile time and show you, re show you results based on that. Really wasn't that hard to write took me maybe a couple of weeks and that's great. That's the great part of DMD design is at least superficially simple. The issues are in the deeper layers which makes them harder to see and harder to work on and I think that this is not something where a collective effort can do much. I think this is an issue where a few experts with the appropriate time and the appropriate funding have to sit together for a while and just straighten DMB out. Just straighten the deep front end out. And I think it can be done. And once we are past that, once we have a system that can actually be understood by a single person, and that can be explained by a single person to others, then we are open again to having nice language extensions and I have quite a few visions for how I want language extensions to work. For example, I would like you to be able to parameterize your allocator based on the usage pattern of the thing that you're allocating. For example, if you are concatenating a lot to a variable, I want you to have a way to estimate that at compile time and to give your allocator that context about the thing that it is reserving memory for. And I know this example may sound silly, but it really motivated me when I saw that this could be done with Core Reflect. However, as soon as I tried to push this example further to maybe show it in a presentation like this one, it failed and I wasn't able to proceed and therefore I went back to work on more fundamental things in the DMD compiler 
which also were the issue with my previous project, type functions, if anybody remembers that. Essentially, we have low-level issues inside the compiler that have to be fixed. I'm actively working on fixing them in order to give you a better metaprogramming experience and a better programming experience of the compiler in general because straightening these things out allows many things to, to be able to happen. For example, being able to properly cache compilation such that you do not just take a random guess whether your cache will be valid or not and sometimes you get a corrupted binaries because you're pulling the wrong object files from your cache which I am sure will happen to some people who do build caching in D. It certainly happened to me when I tried to do it. Rather than that I want to get DMD into a state where you can just ask it about the truth of the of the world where the whole state that it's in can be represented and like I said, in order for that to occur, there is still a lot of work, a lot of sweat, a lot of blood and tears to be shed before we can be there. And I fully intend to work on this as long as my time and my financial situation admits that. And I would like to invite everybody to join me in that effort to make the deep programming language, which certainly is a very progressive and a shining example of what a language can be, actually be that and not be brought down by implementation decisions that were made when D was still in the C++ heritage and when we didn't know how important and how impactful metaprogramming and the metaprogramming abilities indeed would be. Thank you very much for listening and I hope that we can do something about this. Thanks.